welcome everyone to this um, event, which I think is going to be a really exciting conversation between um, three fantastic people. But yeah, so we'll, we'll get into um, the presentation. So our first speaker is um, Murat Ask. Axa, who is an award-winning filmmaker and lecturer in cinematic arts at Ulster University. He received his MA degree in cinema and media studies and PhD in communication and culture from York University. Murat's research focuses on history and aesthetics of independent filmmaking, emerging film genres, and migrant disparate transnational cinemas. So I will hand over to you um, and thank you very much. Thank you. So, um... Just going to the um, share screen and here. And then now you can see it. Yes. And from start. Yes. So it's about practice, and I'm a filmmaker and at the same time a scholar in film and from practice. And um, we are at Ulster University. Cinematic Arts has its own PhD program in cinematic arts practice. And uh, uh, this is a, a fantastic opportunity for those because when I was um, researching the first time going out there to Canada to study filmmaking, there was PhD programs were only available in filmmaking in the UK. So I always wondered what it be, would be like to actually study and make a film as a PhD practice output. Now, the fate has it that where I am, uh, I'm able to supervise new projects in practice. So although this will be about my own ideas as to how to come up with ideas for filmmaking, how to approach it as practice-based research at the same time, I'll also be very proudly speaking of our current PhD students who are wonderful practitioners. So you must have heard uh, uh, about practice-based and practice-led, and even practice or research-informed in practice. These are methods of dealing with uh, film. And our first PhD student was John Deary, and he had the idea to come up with mental health is a big issue in Northern Ireland, where we are based, especially suicide prevention. And John researched heavily on the sociology and mental health when he first came, and that proved to be, you know, very good for his knowledge, but not for the, the improvement of filmmaking practices. So in our second year, we went back to the basics and why would you use film to deal with issues of suicide prevention? So that brings us to the fore. You start with a question and then you decide how film making will be able to contribute to the knowledge of dealing with that social issue so although you know filmmakers are known to be hedonist and very personal in their approach and film funding actually forces it to be that way this perspective of looking at social issues in life and making films related to it uh, is actually part of what we do um, i'll just draw the funding issues uh, uh, later on it's really really interesting um, now we have this process, which should be very much uh, uh, similar everywhere else, that we want to negotiate with the potential students uh, on how the practice will be before they actually come. And around 20 applicants, 10 really take the recommendations to heart, and three or four successful ones go to the interview stage and one may be accepted, and we work with that individual. But we treat everyone equally. So... Then there's the 100-day viva where we actually finish the proposal, make it a coherent project with the researcher, and then confirmation viva where we set the timeline and set the first chapter written. So we meet regularly once a month and observe the progress and try to contribute to the development of the researcher, the filmmaker. So the practice-based versus practice-led are the two terms. And um, the practice-based research is the creative work. Like you actually do the work as a form of research and it is it becomes contribution to the knowledge about filmmaking. Whereas the practice led research is the practice leads to the knowledge that has practical value. For example, you invent something, a new way of framing uh, uh, in cinematography and that becomes a 
film making contribution. Now, I have uh, looked through some of the pioneers of the ideas in the last 20 years, and Desmond Bell actually has written extensively on this as problem of theory and practice somewhat uh, entrenched in departments, such as there are people who actually teach and study uh, film studies and the others who do the practice. And if you don't, because of the ref, submit something like a publication, you put your research unit into risk. So that has pressured people into valuing somewhat more the studies part than the practice part. And John Matier, who's at York at the moment, impact of the digital, he, he has been researching for many years. Kahal McLaughlin, who, is, uh, who was with Ulster now at Queens, has looked at the memory and ethnographic aspects of documentary filmmaking. Eric Knudsen, finding the personal voice in filmmaking. And there's Kerrigan and Beatty, who have a wonderful book on the subject. And Agnieszka Piotr, I couldn't say it properly, Piotr, Roska at uh, University of the Creative Arts has written wonderful books. So these are some of the pioneers. If, if the student of creative filmmaking who, who's doing practice-based or led research into filmmaking wants to do some research into the previous writing on the subject, they could just go and read these. Now, I'll describe how it starts for me as uh, the practitioner, because I had three stages. One of them was the schooling stage when I was a MA and PhD student in, in, in Canada. I was making films on my own or sometimes funded. Then I went back to Turkey where I was born and started lecturing in it and then created some more films. And when I moved to Northern Ireland, then I, I had this approach of a more thoughtful thinking about the consequences and the questions and the research ideas about the films. So that's why that, what drives one to make films? What's that question that is so pressing that I want to make a film? So it could be narrative or experimental or factual, so you need to decide on the form. And then it becomes a unique combination of locations, talent and cast. And there is kind of, unfortunately, kind of a, if you are in the production, some, some of things are, you know, you have to deal with are different, but, but it may also fuel creativity and you need to get it out. That's the beauty of the filmmaking that you need to, once the film is made, you just cannot lock it up. It has to reach its audience. And now we have uh, online platforms available to us. So what I did was in my York period back in the day was coming up uh, with idea from a dance student and then seeing the whole world as mechanized and how can we break it? So back then I was really studying Althusser and different ways of looking at it. Um, so this interpolation was the idea. So I tried to get something highly, highly, very much conceptual idea into dance and on film. And actually the Ontario Arts Council granted uh, uh, some money so that I could shoot it on film. So back then there was filmmaking really shot on negative. And the, the result was really interesting. Then I did two back-to-back -back dramatic short films dealing with uh, uh, a mature student challenges, really. And Love Thy Neighbor was actually inspired by Bunuel. So look at your favorite filmmakers or some of the concepts they develop, such as surrealism, and try to adapt to your own life. So again, the challenge was to shoot on black and white 16 millimeter film. And with war, I was living in a very poor neighborhood in Toronto. Actually, when you are a student, you cannot afford uh, you know, really good places. And the place I found was really a, an area of crime. So that drew me to look at that area and deal with that, of course. Once you are doing these, let's say uh, that is the surreal event. Uh, the, the neighbor is so noisy that uh, uh, the person who's bothered goes and faces the neighbor. And war was about that crime area. Uh, and you are a guerrilla filmmaker. You go out there and shoot it. And then you use the talents of people around you. And I was teaching both film and drama students. And all of the actors in it are finally here. Ryerson University theater students. So that was their first film experience ever. And that was a very good experience for them. So all is learning. So 
then comes the second stage of when you are back in roots, back in Istanbul with all the experience in filmmaking, I noticed that uh, there are certain filmmakers whose films I like a lot. One of them is Bill Douglas and his trilogy about his childhood. And that, that was really inspiring for me that someone who lived uh, a few decades before me had a terrible childhood and wanted to put it on film. And it's really about the memory. Uh, and I said, I want to do something like that, like about my childhood and growing up in the 70s, 80s and 90s. So I created this idea of having three children uh, representing uh, uh, different aspects in society, such as labor, uh, traditionalism and Westernism. And but they come together in the end. So, of course, you are also influenced by the filmmakers from your own land, such as Yilmaz Güney. And Yilmaz Güney has a film called Duar, Wall, which he made in exile in France. And it's about children in a prison. And it was very, very influential on me. So I was inspired by that and wrote the first film and went into fun funding. Like, uh, but during that, that's the second stage. You want to make your first feature and you have an interesting idea. It's about memory and childhood and oppression. And then the producers ask this, do you have a proof of concept film? Do you have some short film that shows that you are able to deal with these? So then I said, let's make one. And I got, again, friends who are part-time lecturers, practicing filmmakers, and the cast are, I was then teaching film and drama master's program in Turkey, which was also professional actors getting their MFAs in acting. So we made this film and I took one character, a side character from my feature screenplay and made him the main character of the short film as proof of concept. Kind of a full character in, in kind of a Shakespearean sense. And I was able to work with the, you know, the, the uh, Tarkovsky's final films, Camera Operator, who's now a great DP, like Korsian. And we, we made a good, very good film together. And that was screened at the film festivals. And that's a proud moment because once you go to Berlin or Cannes, and there you meet your friends, students, and former lecturers all there, that's you, you enter a new stage in your life and career that now you are one of the filmmakers and uh, uh, your ideas are on screen. So that these are some of the stills from the film, The Hoarder. Garip is a word in Turkish that means both strange, but at the same time, poor one. And uh, a crazy person who is in love with the local uh, uh, neighborhood's girl and saves him and uh, her boyfriend from tugs in the 1970s. And he is then lynched. So, Inspiration comes from a variety of sources. And uh, uh, so one of them is Faulkner, uh, Light in August, the novel. And I took the second step. So I was asked then this question by the producers. These producers always ask these questions whether you are able to deliver. I said, can you direct child actors? Now I'm thinking, I, I, I proved to you that I'm able to direct you know, a period piece with a professional cast and crew. Now you ask me something else said, okay, let's direct child actors. Where to find them? Now, where I used to lecture, is Kadiras University neighborhood is old neighborhood. And it's about hundreds of years of old houses uh, left from the Greek uh, people who had to leave in the 1960s. And they're unoccupied, but when the Syrian civil war happened, they moved in. Those refugees are now living there without electricity or water, in darkness, in very old houses. And that's where I uh, wrote a story about a child who was a go-between, two lovers, one from Syria and the other one is a Turkish girl and the brothers and the parents are preventing this forbidden love. And the child is carrying messages between the two. I said, let's do it. And I was able to show uh, the lives of Syrian refugees, children desolate on the streets, and then was able to actually work with the local children with the help of uh, the neighborhood and the local translators and the parents. And it's a, you know, 20 children were in the film and we were able to do it. So it's a very interesting film and I recommend everyone to re revisit. Now, what I do is all of my films are available on women on YouTube for free because you need to share and get it out there. 
So that is not in. Not in is actually uh, uh, delicate in as a translation, and not in uh, is a kind of a woman name. Like it's 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 supposed to be a young girl who would be carrying messages. But on the day of the shoot, we learned that they were removed from that neighborhood. So I couldn't find my actor. So instead we went to the street and asked who wants to play in a film? And these kids volunteered. So suddenly it's a boy and the film still works. So that's another lesson for a budding filmmaker. When you are doing your practice, sometimes you're challenged with such impossible situations that you need to come up with solutions. So within the hour, we resolve this issue. Then I said, let's direct the funded film in Northern Ireland. And Northern Ireland screen is very much open uh, through access shorts program for older people, for LGBT, for BAME. So different like people ordinarily who wouldn't have access to funding resources, they have a private specials program to support them. So I applied uh, based on my migrant experience and dealing with uh, people uh, refugees in Canada who were exploited by people who were translating for them at courts, I was doing free translation so that they wouldn't be exploited. So I listened to a lot of stories. And one of them was that suddenly uh, uh, you find yourself uh, in a secret police room facility and you're asked questions, like interrogated. Do you know what this is or what that is? So I took that experience into a film and it, it touches another court because in the 1970s, it seems in Northern Ireland, there was something called the internment. Suddenly they could just arrest anyone and put in prison without trial. So my experience post 9-11 in Canada translated into as if it's 1970s Northern Ireland. So something that wouldn't ordinarily happen, that becomes a transnational filmmaking practice. So um, of course, people want to see when it's public money, that is to be spent, you need to show, again, proof that you are able to direct it. And I was able to create a proof of concept again and convince a veteran producer, Chris Martin, who was actually in Cannes at the moment, I found his Twitter and asked, you know, I need a producer. And he was very nice and helpful and recommended his production manager. And it's a, it's a very, it's like magic. Now, how many times you're on a film set that something that starts in your head and then you write, and then you go out there, get funded. And when you go and produce it, it's like magic because when it actually happens, uh, you think, wow, it, it, it happened. It's like miracle. It's, that's, that's a very powerful present. It's like a godlike presence even because things in your head becoming reality is just giving you a certain responsibility to do uh, 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 things that you, know, you, you have to be right and just and treat your subject in a very ethical manner because everything can go wrong and uh, that your it may go out of your intention it's about representation suddenly you may be finding yourself representing migrants as uh, uh, robbers or killers or evil people that's not your intention that's why the tone of the film matters i was lucky that i was able to get one of the great actors uh, in Northern Ireland who agreed to do it, who was also in, in Hunger by Steve McQueen. Lucky to have uh, uh, a very important BBC TV series shot in Northern Ireland so that there was talent enough so uh, to actually help us shoot the process and Game of Thrones. So all that practice helps you as an independent filmmaker because you have people who have practice doing other things. Now, the next step, what will I do? So I was asked by my uh, research director, so if you want to do a project and will present it for REF, what kind of a concept would that be? And I said, from the beginning, I had the idea that, you know, people's lives, especially women's lives are difficult in Turkey. And I've witnessed that over and over. So I want to come up with an alternative aesthetic that would empower women characters on screen. And there have been lots of films, especially since 2000, that the new Turkish cinema had strong female leads. But you end up, and you would have some uh, uh, women directors directing very powerful 
characters in films. So how would I do something additional? So one thing was that uh, I've seen a trend of representation uh, from the emerging uh, young uh, woman filmmakers that are very radical and going to hardcore levels of showing their characters being brutalized by a patriarchy, usually through different means like murder, rape, kidnapping, all of it that was hush hush uh, uh, in, in the society or not reported that often, these new young women filmmakers were able to do it. So some of them are now rising stars. So I looked at the women first time directors since 2000, even 2010, they would have estranged women, locked up women, repressed women, depressed, fallen, raped. So the, the, the idea is to expose actually the injustices, which I sympathize a lot, but I said, this will not be the step I'll be taking. I have to take empowering steps rather than victimhood witnessing or trauma memory stage. So I just gave you example, Mustang is one of those examples which turned out to be the foreign uh, language Oscar nominee, uh, but only one or two characters are able to escape. Like some of them kill themselves. It's like virgin suicides. That's, that's the attitude. I, I said, I won't be taking that attitude. I need to be empowering the character. So what I did was I also dis discovered that new Turkish cinema has some misogynistic uh, films in it, especially by male directors who are really you now brilliant directors. Some of them are winning awards worldwide, but it ends up not giving enough voice to women. These are the br brutalization films made by the rising talent and they are winning awards, but I said, I want to move away from that. So I said at the narrative level, what kind of plot elements I could use to give women characters agency so that they won't be just showing victimization? And is it possible to create realist representation that resists narrative conformity and opens up new areas of struggle for women characters? And through the use of film form, is it possible to reframe heteronormativity in Turkish cinema so that there are strong women characters who are not ashamed of their sexuality uh, and uh, uh, happy to express it. So this is about cultural intervention. So that's what I did. I had a strong female character. I wrote the script. Now it's in development stage. Hopefully it will turn into a feature in about a year or two, and it will be a different film. And it aims to reframe gaze. Now gaze is one of the important subjects uh, since the 1970s uh, due to Laura Malvi's contribution. Can I just reverse that female gaze, uh, male gaze into female gaze in a film? So it's a widowed woman who is humiliated and mistreated and decides to fight back the system. So fights back, again, interpolation, again, Althusser idea, fights back against institutions of marriage, hospitals, family, all of it. So I, I, you see, it's like a cycle. 20 years after I made the first funded film, I come back to the similar similar ideas so that's why and again andrea arnold for example is one of the people who uh, inspired me i i met her at the foil film festival and watched her films and uh, met her and talked about what can be done you know have a strong woman character and that was inspiring for me and i have seen a, a, an asian film in berlin film festival called three year and three month retreat about a female character in a difficult situation and uh, some, some other favorite films. So of course, casting is one area that is very difficult because if you are going uh, to get funded, then producers ask you, what kind of a star name can you attach to your project? If you bring so-and-so, we'll give you money. And not everyone can actually deliver the kind of performance you want, or sometimes they may think that it may damage their reputation. So when you are dealing with a woman, character that has to go through uh, mental institutions, love scenes, fainting, fighting back, crowds, all of it could be quite difficult. So I have met some of the leading actresses and am now waiting. One of them will be actually getting back to me. So I at this mood board, 
to present them. Like, what kind of a film do you have in mind? I have this mood in terms of the look, uh, the texture, and the lighting. And that's when you go back and refer to some of the films you liked or some of the images that you are inspired by to use in your film. And um, so I, I, I then went and made a scene, like shot a scene, like one part of the script that I have written so that I would show the potential actors of what it would be like. So that's another proof of concept moment. Um, so I have this plan, not just an ice screen or a Netflix application, also Berlin on a pitch. And then Netflix pitch, and we'll see if it is October 29th is when actually we'll be hearing from them. And if the actress is on board, the film will be made. Now, I, I thank you for, for uh, sharing the uh, link to my work. It's actually, yes, YouTube has it. Also, Vimeo has it. Vimeo, if you go vimeo.com and write Protax hash, you'll be able to see even more material. Thanks, Katie, for putting the links. I'll actually put those links here. And I realize that we have gone through half an hour. So it's not time to show anything. I actually had multiple clips to show, but that would take hours. So during isolation, I should say, I said, I shouldn't be just sitting at home and do nothing. I went out there in Belfast and shot it as an isolated empty place, made a 90 second video and just to record those memories. And if I wanted to share that with you, you know, for 90 seconds, it's here. So I'm switching from this to the shared screen mode here. And let's take a look and if it's because it's short. Here's my take on. Do you hear it? Yes. So I'll just continue. Isolation in the beloved city of Belfast. First, what I see is blue skies and empty streets. Then it is a city of fowls now. Is that the Omega Man that I see before me? Before the outbreak, Belfast was a heaven on earth. It was a touristic city known for its hospitality. A city where peace-loving folk lived. I just cannot stand the closure of my places of worship now. Reading the papers lifts my spirit now. Did we really stand together before all this? I feel like a lonely kite stuck at the edge of a building. Will we be able to see the end of the tunnel? Is there a future for our children? Or will they suffer like we did? Only time will tell. So this is really important in the sense that the at the moment, none of those billboards or the bus banners are there. They changed. So that was a unique moment that I captured. And I used my mobile phone to do it. It's 90 seconds and it has a kind of an ironic tone. And I said, you know, it's not just rather than staying home and getting bored, go out there and make a film. So that's the, the actually the lesson of the day. So you have an idea, something bothers you, go there and shoot it as a film and share it with the rest of the world. And if you have a research question to begin with in the beginning, all the better. But even then, when you make the finishing, finishing the work itself, you can revisit and say, yeah, that was the reason why I started. And that's the actual research question that I started with. So I guess, yep. Sorry. Lovely. Thank, thank you so much for um, such a rich 
um, presentation, particularly you know, the ways in which you were thinking about what inspires you. I think we can all um, kind of learn from that reflection on inspiration, but also some of those kind of practical considerations that you were talking about yeah. um, and the way in which you know, we, we want to always come back to the research questions and, and the kind of self-reflection that you talked about. Absolutely.